Humanity has come a long way in our understanding of the universe and our place in it. For much of our history, we thought the Earth was at the center of everything, with the sun and all the planets revolving around us. Of course, later it was realized that the Earth and the planets go around the sun, and the sun is a star, one among many billions in a collection known as a galaxy, and our galaxy is just one of many billions in the universe itself. Currently, we are living in what's been called the golden age of cosmology. Our understanding of the universe, its history, its contents, has undergone rapid advances, both observationally and theoretically, in the last few decades. But there are a few key mysteries that still remain. And one of the central mysteries is simply what makes up most of the matter in the universe. Because one thing that we know is whatever it is, it's not the same kind of matter that makes up things like people or planets or stars. So let's orient ourselves as people who live on a planet that orbits a star, and there we are. This artist's conception of the Milky Way, we're about 25,000 light years from the center of our galaxy. We orbit a star that orbits the galactic center. But there's a lot more to our galaxy than what's represented by this picture, the standard stars and gas and dust that we're familiar with. That extra is the dark matter. If you could visualize what the dark matter looks like, it'd be something more like this. So the blue here represents the dark matter, and there's our familiar luminous disk with its spiral arms embedded in what's called a dark matter halo, and we move through this halo. Well, one obvious question is, how much dark matter is there in the universe? And for that, let's talk about football. An American football field, imagine the area of this field represents all the matter density in the universe. All the standard particles would only represent the end zones. The dark matter would comprise the rest of the field. Studies show there are about five times as much dark matter as there is ordinary matter. Well, this leads to another question. There's so much of this stuff around. Why isn't it? I can't see it. We can't feel it. Well, one of the leading explanations is that dark matter is a wimp. As may be obvious to you, this stands for a weakly interacting massive particle. Right? So dark matter is thought to be a new type of particle. Right? And it interacts extraordinarily weakly with ordinary particles. It interacts so weakly that most WIMP models predict there are a few billion particles of dark matter passing through your body right now every second. Yet you do not feel them. Okay, well if they interact so weakly, how do we know this stuff is there to begin with? For that we turn to the gravitational effects. So what one can do is go and study a galaxy. The stars, the gas, and the dust in the galaxy are held there by gravitation. If you can measure the velocities of these objects as they move around the galaxy, that can give you a handle on how much mass there is of that galaxy. Right? All you have to do is apply just the Newtonian laws of mechanics that we know. There's an interesting type of an analogy, an historical analogy, to this study. In the 19th century, Newton's laws had already been laid down, had been known, and people very carefully studied the orbits of planets. But something was amiss with the orbit of Uranus. There were little wobbles in its orbit that seemed to not be able to be explained by Newtonian mechanics. Well, the scientist, Le Verrier, did very accurate calculations, and he had an idea. If there was some extra mass outside the orbit of Uranus, and he calculated where that mass should be. This could account for these little wobbles in the orbit. Well, he wrote down his calculation. He sent it in a letter to an observatory in Berlin. They opened it. That night, they pointed their telescope where he said they should, and they found the planet Neptune. This is an example of finding dark matter. Although Neptune is not this exotic type of dark matter, obviously it's a planet. It's made of the same kind of stuff that we are. 
So you can go and look at the orbital dynamics of these objects in a galaxy and get a handle on the mass of the entire galaxy. There's another means of getting at the mass of a galaxy. If you can measure the totality of the light, all of the electromagnetic radiation that comes from a galaxy, you also can get a number for the mass. And here's where it gets interesting. These two different mechanisms for measuring the mass give discrepant results. And that difference is made up by the dark matter. So you may say, well, perhaps this is just a galactic scale effect. But there's other evidence. You can go to the scales of galactic clusters. For example, here's the Coma Cluster. It's a group of thousands of galaxies. Now you can study actually the motions of the individual galaxies and the hot gas between the galaxies. And once again, you find you need more mass than what can be accounted for by the light. There are other means of determining that there is dark matter. You can look at the bending of light due to what's called gravitational lensing as it's affected by gravitation. You can look at the large scale structure growth in the universe. You can also measure what's called the cosmic microwave background radiation. This is light from only 380,000 years after the beginning of the universe. All of these different methods give the same answer. You need some dark matter that is not like our standard matter. And there's about five times as much of it as there is of ordinary matter. Well, how do you then get at the particle nature of this stuff? How do you know what the individual particle masses are and how could it possibly interact with our standard matter? For that, we go back to this idea of us moving in a dark matter halo. Think about driving down the street in your car. Put your hand out the window, right? And you can feel the wind, okay? Similarly, as we travel through the dark matter halo, we should experience a wimp wind. However, your hand or your dog are not really sensitive enough to get at the underlying particle nature of dark matter. So instead, perhaps you'd rather use, say, 100 kilograms of liquid xenon, put it underneath a mountain in Italy. And that's what's been done. Here's the Xenon 100 group in an underground lab under the Grand Sasso mountain in Italy. They have over 100 kilograms of liquid xenon, and what they look for is dark matter entering their detector, causing a reaction with standard particles, and then they can measure what happens from there. It's an extraordinarily sensitive detector. They still have not seen any clear dark matter interactions, though. They are currently in the process of upgrading to one ton of liquid xenon. Well, perhaps mountains in Italy aren't your style, and you'd rather go to Say, what was the largest and deepest underground gold mine in North America? That's what the Lux group has done. They have 370 kilograms of liquid xenon, about a mile beneath the Black Hills in South Dakota. They also look for dark matter coming in, reacting with ordinary matter, and measuring the consequences. There's still further groups. For example, at Snow Lab, two kilometers beneath Ontario, Canada. There are groups such as the Deep 3600. They have over three and a half tons of liquid argon, where they look for these direct interactions of dark matter and ordinary matter. Or the super cryogenic dark matter search. Soon they'll be moving to Snow Lab, and they have these ultra pure, ultra cold, ultra sensitive germanium and silicon detectors that also look for this direct interaction. There are other means of trying to measure the particle nature of dark matter. Through indirect means, if dark matter interacts with itself in the galaxy, then the products of those interactions could possibly be measured here on Earth. So for example, this is a picture of a fantastic scientific laboratory. It's called the Ice Cube Detector at the South Pole. They have very long strands of detectors that are placed down holes drilled over a kilometer deep in the ice. And what they look for are elementary particles called neutrinos. And some of these neutrinos could possibly be the end products of dark matter interactions. Well, besides underground laboratories here on the Earth, there are also studies done off the Earth. For example, this is the AMS detector. It's on the International Space Station, and it detects cosmic rays. And once again, some of these cosmic rays could be the end product of dark matter interactions. There are other space-based instruments, such as the Fermi Gamma Ray Telescope. They look for very energetic gamma radiation that could come from dark matter. These are very incredible and sensitive 
detectors, but none of them have unambiguously detected the dark matter yet. So instead of trying to indirectly detect it or directly detect it, it sure would be great if you could just go to a lab and make this stuff, and that's what some people are trying to do. This is a picture of the Large Hadron Collider. This is a picture of the Large Hadron Collider. <laughs> so this is a fantastic facility at the CERN laboratory in Geneva, Switzerland. It's a 27 kilometer, 17 mile ring, about 100 meters beneath the French and Swiss countryside. It is the largest and most energetic particle collider on Earth. They take protons, accelerate them to energies of 99.999% the speed of light, smash them into each other, and then try to see what the products of those collisions are. So what would dark matter look like in such a collider? Well, it interacts so weakly, it wouldn't deposit its energy inside a detector. It would escape leaving a missing energy signal. So you can measure the energy of the protons before they collide. You can measure what all this stuff is that comes out, and the imbalance, this missing energy signal, could be the dark matter. So just as a scientific endeavor, this place is incredible. There are over 7,000 scientists, technicians, and students, representing well over 40 countries. And they have come together to build one of the most incredible machines in the history of humanity. They've also built some of the most incredible and intricate and enormous detectors in the history of humanity. Here is the Atlas detector, and for scale, that's a person. Right? So collisions happen inside this detector, and they're able to measure all of the constituent particles that come out. So you can see there's this incredible global effort to search for the particle nature of dark matter. Well, how do we fit in to this picture here in Acadiana? Well, I'm a theoretical physicist, and I work in the physics department, which is a wonderful department here at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. And I, as a theorist, build mathematical models along with my collaborators in the United States and around the world. So we try to build a framework with which you could interpret any of these observational signatures, which we're very hopeful to see in the upcoming next few years. We also, in our model building, will try to predict, oh, here's some signals that you guys should go out and look for as well. Right? So as a theoretical physicist, what is it that I do? Right? It's, as the great physicist Richard Feynman said, it's imagination in a straitjacket. There's a lot of creativity, we get to play with a lot of fun models and equations, but in the end, nature has the final word on whether what we say is true or not. So what is it that we would get if we were to discover the particle nature of dark matter? So if you're thinking of some kind of imminent technological innovations, I would be very surprised if that happened anytime soon. Knowing the mass and the interactions of dark matter is probably not going to lower your electricity bill in the next few years or make your television signal any clearer. So I wouldn't hold out hope for those kind of things. But anytime you do science at the frontier, one never knows. Even something like this laser came from a study of just fundamental quantum mechanics. Right? But we're not there yet. What we are trying to understand is the fundamental nature of one of the building blocks of the universe. Dark matter is the seeds from which all the structure in the universe was built. This is a picture from the Hubble Deep Field, and this large-scale structure comes from dark matter. So, in the upcoming years, we are very excited about the prospects for discovery. But when you're working at the forefront of knowledge, one never knows what surprises may be lurking. But we have a lot of great experiments, and we think, as theorists, we have a lot of good ideas, and hopefully in the next few years, we'll be able to shed some light on dark matter. Thank you. <laughs>